Um, Carlin and I are so excited to have you uh, with us tonight. This is Carlin's third session that she's done for the WOW Speaker Series. And so I know I'm thrilled to have her as a partner. And I know many of you have really enjoyed the opportunity to connect with her um, through the WOW Speaker Series. And hopefully, um, someday soon, even in person, which will be lovely. Tonight, we're excited to have you join us for WOW Speaker Series, Bye 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 to Imposter Syndrome and Hello Authentic Leadership. For some of you who've not been part of our WOW community, um, just a little bit of background, but Women of Ohio Westland started in 2016 with an on-campus opportunity for people to connect um, with each other as alumni, uh, friends, parents, students, and We've really grown this program over the last uh, couple of years into something that's a very a signature program for Ohio Wesleyan, which we're really proud of. So it celebrates being in a community with other leading Ohio Wesleyan women, learning and sharing from each other and walking away hopefully with fresh perspectives. Um, the WOW Speaker Series came out of our, our WOW Weekend, which we have on campus, and we are look, we're looking forward to hosting another WOW Weekend in 2022. Um, more info to come on that soon. But a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you're able, we would love for you to show us your face so we can see you. Um, this will be an interactive session this evening. And so it's important that we have opportunities to connect and seeing faces certainly helps with that. Uh, we will be using the breakout feature for a portion of the session. So please make sure that your name on your device is and if you're using two devices, make sure that you have your name listed um, on there so we can make sure we're putting you in a, in a room with others. Um, and then just remember to mute yourself during the presentation, but don't mute yourself during the breakout session. We absolutely want to hear from you, to share in dialogue and encourage that conversation that is really important to the WOW community. So again, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Carlin Crowley. Uh, Carlin is Ohio Wesleyan's first female provost in 180 years, professor of English and gender studies scholar. Um, and Carlin was recently profiled in diverse uh, issues in higher education magazine as one of the nation's top 25 women in higher ed. So I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Carlin and all of you tonight. Thank you so much. I love the cats are here. Oh, people are clapping. People are in their comfies. You're showing up just as you are at Plaza. It's so nice to see you. Uh, as I always say, this is number three and you could be binge watching or dancing to K-pop or petting your cat. You're getting the multitask and here you are getting ready to talk about imposter syndrome. I wanted to uh, let you know that we're covering this topic in part because of you. Katie ran a poll after last uh, session and asked what topics are most on your mind and, and what do you want to talk about? And this was one of the ones that you really wanted to talk about. So I'm so glad you're here. I really, I'd like to dedicate tonight to my mother. My mother uh, was someone who as you'll learn uh, from this New York Times piece I'm going to talk about at the end about how to how to really, how women in particular uh, and also marginalized folks can combat imposter syndrome. There's some techniques and I'm gonna share one technique with you, which is that you learn how to have positive self-talk. It's very simple, but there's so much science behind it now. And when I was a little girl, uh, my mom used to practice speaking in the mirror frequently. Uh, she was a woman who was first generation college student, went to law school in her 40s, had a legal career for years and years, and people really underestimated her often, and she was incredibly powerful. But growing up as a little girl, I used to watch her uh, when she was going to have hard conversations at work, she would practice them in the mirror. And that just was really powerful to watch and to see her do that. And that kind of self-talk and practice is one of the ways, very simple ways and effective ways that you can combat imposter syndrome. So uh, as I was thinking about tonight, one of the ways that imposter syndrome is alive for me uh, tonight, uh, and it's something I've been thinking about for a long time, is I had these amazing notes that I was going to share with you about imposter syndrome, and then I lost them. <laughs> and I couldn't find them. So I thought, oh, that's funny. Because, you know, this is the truth. It's real, right? This is, this is what happens. And then you think, well, wait, will it be as good? Well, of course it will be as good, right? Because I've internalized what I want to say 
Um, but I had that moment of panic, right? Will this be as good? Am I able to? All those, those things that, that come into your mind that we're going to talk about tonight that have a name. We're going to give them a name. So part of why I was delighted that people wanted to talk that while women and folks wanted to talk about imposter syndrome is as somebody who's taught hundreds of young women and women's and gender studies and have men has mentored many women in higher ed. Um, I'm a faculty member of the Higher Education Resource Services, which is the oldest serving women's leadership development for women in higher education. It started when Title IX started. And you would think, oh, is it still relevant? So I mentioned this in the first talk I gave, which is that roughly 25% um, of presidents in, in higher education at colleges and universities, of which there are around 4,000 in the United States, are women. So that number is at 25%. Um, and that's the highest it's ever been, right? And the provost number or the chief academic officer is around that number too as well. And when you look at women of color and men of color, those numbers really start to, to plummet. So uh, higher ed is in a really interesting moment, right? Historically, you have record numbers of students of color, of women coming into higher ed, and yet the leadership at the, at the top has not still shifted. So part of being on the faculty of HERS, as it's called, is helping to develop that next generation of leaders. And one of the things that I noticed in working with women and having, spending basically two weeks at camp on leadership development with them, having late night popcorn and wine, early morning breakfast, again and again, certain themes would emerge and they are classic. Can I do this thing? Am I able to be a leader? This feels like a stretch to me. Am I qualified? I don't think I deserve this. How will I ever get that there, right? And uh, just recently, there is a woman from a HERS class that I worked with last year at Wellesley who got a very big promotion at NYU, New York University. And we talked about her title for days. And she said, I can't have that title. I said, yes, you can have that title. You can have this title with these words in it. She said, no, no, I can't have that title. I battled with her for two days. I said, look, Let's, let's, let's break, make a deal. Present to your boss the title and have a couple of alternatives in your pocket. But I'm going to tell you, this, this is who you are. This is what you are capable of. And she said, Carlin, you're not going to believe this, but my boss didn't even blink. And he gave me the title. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> friends don't say I told you so. So what I've observed in young women and a student who texted me today, one of my former students who's applying for jobs. And I said, you actually could be applying for jobs basically two levels up. She's like, really? Okay, well, maybe. I said, yeah, you could. Um, the sense that we might not be worthy or once we achieve leadership, we're not worthy, right? Am I really this thing? So today we're gonna talk about that. This is how tonight's gonna go. We've got a couple of video clips that are educational and then we're going to, into breakout rooms to talk about those and process them. And we have some techniques for you to address imposter syndrome. And I just wanna invite you that if it's not something you've experienced, though I would find that hard to believe, these are things that you can share with girls and women and other folks who may experience this in some way in your life um, because they're easy techniques. They take a lifetime to work on, but they're ready to hand. So uh, Katie, without further ado, Katie's going to show us our first video clip, which is an intro to this term. It's about four minutes. Even after writing 11 books and winning several prestigious awards, Maya Angelou couldn't escape the nagging doubt that she hadn't really earned her accomplishments. Albert Einstein experienced something similar. He described himself as an involuntary swindler whose work didn't deserve as much attention as it had received. Accomplishments at the level of Angelou's or Einstein's are rare, but their feeling of fraudulence is extremely common. Why can't so many of us shake feelings that we haven't earned our accomplishments or that our ideas and skills aren't worthy of others' attention? Psychologist Pauline Rose Clance was the first to study this unwarranted sense of insecurity. In her work as a therapist, she noticed many of her undergraduate patients shared a concern. 
Though they had high grades, they didn't believe they deserved their spots at the university. Some even believed their acceptance had been an admissions error. While Clance knew these fears were unfounded, she could also remember feeling the exact same way in graduate school. She and her patients experienced something that goes by a number of names, imposter phenomenon, imposter experience, and imposter syndrome. Together with colleague Suzanne Imes, Clance first studied imposterism in female college students and faculty. Their work established pervasive feelings of fraudulence in this group. Since that first study, the same thing has been established across gender, race, age, and a huge range of occupations, though it may be more prevalent and disproportionately affect the experiences of underrepresented or disadvantaged groups. To call it a syndrome is to downplay how universal it is. It's not a disease or an abnormality, and it isn't necessarily tied to depression, anxiety, or self-esteem. Where do these feelings of fraudulence come from? People who are highly skilled or accomplished tend to think others are just as skilled. This can spiral into feelings that they don't deserve accolades and opportunities over other people. And as Angelou and Einstein experienced, there's often no threshold of accomplishment that puts these feelings to rest. Feelings of imposterism aren't restricted to highly skilled individuals either. Everyone is susceptible to a phenomenon known as pluralistic ignorance, where we each doubt ourselves privately, but believe we're alone in thinking that way because no one else voices their doubts. Since it's tough to really know how hard our peers work, how difficult they find certain tasks, or how much they doubt themselves, there's no easy way to dismiss feelings that we're less capable than the people around us. Intense feelings of imposterism can prevent people from sharing their great ideas or applying for jobs and programs where they'd excel. At least so far, the most surefire way to combat imposter syndrome is to talk about it. Many people suffering from imposter syndrome are afraid that if they ask about their performance, their fears will be confirmed. And even when they receive positive feedback, it often fails to ease feelings of fraudulence. But on the other hand, hearing that an advisor or mentor has experienced feelings of imposterism can help relieve those feelings. The same goes for peers. Even simply finding out there's a term for these feelings can be an incredible relief. Once you're aware of the phenomenon, you can combat your own imposter syndrome by collecting and revisiting positive feedback. One scientist who kept blaming herself for problems in her lab started to document the causes every time something went wrong. Eventually, she realized most of the problems came from equipment failure and came to recognize her own competence. We may never be able to banish these feelings entirely, but we can have open conversations about academic or professional challenges. With increasing awareness of how common these experiences are, perhaps we can feel freer to be frank about our feelings and build confidence in some simple truths. You have talent, you are capable, and you belong. All right, so we're going to get ready to go into breakout rooms. I hope that little video was so simple and it's really easy to share, right? To think about a great term we learned, which is this notion of pluralistic ignorance, right? That these feelings of imposterism, we feel like are ours and ours alone, but if we share them, just the simple act of sharing them actually is liberating and shows us that we're not alone and that they're common. And also the takeaway of you have talent, you're capable and you belong. In the breakout rooms, we're going to ask one another, where have you observed imposter syndrome, or we were challenged in that video not to talk about it as a syndrome, right? Imposterism. How does it appear? What does it taste, smell, touch, and look like? Okay, have fun. We're going to put you in the rooms for about seven minutes, and then we'll come back and check in with one another. Welcome back, everyone. I want to remind everybody that the chat is open too. Does anybody want to share a story that they heard about imposterism or imposter phenomenon, or if they're willing to, or maybe to share someone else's story? We'll put something in the chat. You can raise your hand or give a little emoji. There aren't enough Zoom emojis for my taste, but. <laughs> We had um, a parent, Jennifer, who talked about um, she works in IT and 
Jennifer, how do you describe it as a, a bro field, I think? Is that oh, right? yeah. It's like total white male bro. I live in Boston and my boss is, I'm 53. My boss just turned 28. So like he could be my son. Um, I'm a, I, but my son goes to Owu now. He's a sophomore there. Um, and I had never heard of Owu before he decided to go there. And I love the school. I was there over the break, not the homecoming, but I went for the break with my mom and we just loved it so much, by the way. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's hard as a middle-aged woman to be in this. I'm usually the only woman in the meeting and it's super technical and I'm a writer. So my job is to take this programming language and the, the software developers and put it into English. And so I, ha I had terrible imposter syndrome, um, but I was saying that my boss was like, he really empowered me. <laughs> he was like, look, you're the expert. You know, I hired you to do this and, and, you're, and you're great. You're doing a great job. So I think everything that you were saying in the beginning to the intro really resonated with me. Um, it's hard to, it, it's just so easy to tear yourself down. And we have to stop doing that as women. Jennifer, thank you so much. Are you a technical writer? Uh, no, I usually do like advertising and marketing, mm -hmm. copywriting. So this is a big, and I have a liberal arts degree, by the way. Yeah. So I yeah. really, yeah, I feel very strongly about the liberal arts and small schools and stuff. And so um, I'm digressing. That's what okay. No, no, I know. I just no, don't no, worry. No. I, no, no, this is wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing so authentically. Thank and you. I want to capture your term. Did you say bro field? Yeah, it's like a like a <laughs> yeah. dude bro, dude bros. They're all like 20. I thought it was, 30s. yeah, just that it was like a, also a, like an atmosphere, you know, that, that you were entering into. It's so interesting that you tell that story because I shared the story about my mom going back to law school in her forties and she was in law school with everyone in her twenties. Um, and that was, she talked a lot about that with me, right? What does it mean uh, to, in a context, feel so radically other? And then how do you figure out um, not how to fit in, but to be authentic in that space? My best friend is a chief of staff at Google is a humanities person um, my age. And I went to visit her and I said, you're the only middle-aged woman here. <laughs> I mean, and she said, yes. And I'm the only person almost with a non-technical degree, right? And so many of us can find ourselves in situations where um, whether by identity or work, we feel radically other. Um, and it's really easy in those contexts to feel, I call it the Star Wars trash compactor effect if Star Wars means anything to you, where you just start to feel squeezed in terms of your own authenticity and how you lead and how do you, you know, resist and push back. So one of the things we're going to talk about, and someone else shared in the chat, thank you so much. Um, so is the question, is the being a posture exclusively felt among women? No. It's, so we had the example of Maya Angelou and Albert Einstein, but in particular, the research shows among people who feel marginalized in some way by their identity, whether it's people of color or LGBT folks or issues around class, right? Um, being first generation in college, the first person in your family to go to college or being working class. Um, anytime you have an identity that might feel other or marginalized or outside the norm, the norm is always relative, um, you can feel an imposter syndrome because you think the norm does not feel the, the syndrome or imposterism itself. Um, great questions, right? The feeling tends to arise in work settings. Oh, right, so especially work, right? Yeah, and I think so, the distinct, oh, I'm sorry. Carol. No, please, yeah. Oh, is it, it was, it, Yes. Yeah. So yeah, go. It, it, the discussion was around, um, um, and Anne, definitely chime in here. You had such terrific remarks around this, but it's even when you're serving on boards or you're on committees for your community, or you're even in a leadership role with the parent teacher association, like it's just those time, types of roles don't tend to give rise to this, this feeling. Um, whereas in the 
in the work setting is where it seems that it seems to be a lot more uh, intense or, or um, evident. So it was just interesting because in these other environments, you're still out there, you're still leading, you're still you know, putting yourself out there and you're making things happen. But for some reason, those situations don't tend to trigger these type, these same types of feelings. That's so, that's really interesting, Katie. And I think, I think it can depend on identity, right? Because for some people, being even on a school board might be intimidating um, and it can depend on context, but being sensitive to context is really helpful. And so for the people in your group, that feels really prescient, right? Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is, so when this arises and when these feelings arises, what are some ways that we can um, address them? So Katie, will you show this slide next, please? It's a gross slide. So um, this famous book, and I'd love to know if any of you know it, it's, you see, it just, it's had its 30 year anniversary. It's called Taming Your Gremlin, a surprisingly simple method for getting out of your own way by Rick Carson. It is a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. It is so easy to read. Uh, and he has now, of course, you know, a workbook, et cetera. Uh, this book was given to me in, when I was in my twenties, but I really used it when working on a big project. Um, and so I named my gremlin. This is my gremlin. His name is Mucinex. <laughs> He's the gremlin from the Mucinex commercials. Um, if you know what those are, it's like a allergy cold medicine. My 10 year old just saw him. She's like, that is so gross, mommy. I said, that's the point, right? He's supposed to look like that. I have a picture of him in my office um, because sometimes I talk to him. So Part of uh, the work of Rick Carson and Taming Your Gremlin, and Katie, you can move out from the slide, though I know we're going to go to the breakout room, is he, he asks, um, and he suggests, first of all, name it, give it a face, uh, choose something, and put it in some representational way in your space, whether it's in a mirror or a locker or in a post-it. Uh, I have I have another one of these in my post-it in a lipstick case. <laughs> so put it somewhere. And um, one of his first suggestions is simply to notice it, right? He has a very Buddhist approach to the gremlin. And uh, I wanted to tell you some of the things that he says about the gremlin. He says, simply notice. Notice your thoughts, feelings, fantasies, memories, and assumptions. And notice that the natural you is not any of these, right? So anything related to the gremlin is not actually the true work, the true you. He also suggests to just breathe when you observe your gremlin, right? Um, he says, think of your awareness as a spotlight you can direct wherever you choose. Your awareness is a spotlight that you're in control of and you can direct wherever you choose. And so he suggests that once you're in a battle with your gremlin and you're arguing with your gremlin, your gremlin has already won, right? So part of it is how to make peace with that gremlin and come to terms with it. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking to my gremlin, especially when I'm doing writing projects. Um, so we're gonna invite you in breakout rooms to think about your gremlin. So Katie, if you can put the slide up, who is your gremlin? What do they look like? What do they smell and feel like? What do you do when they emerge? And what could you try differently? We're gonna have smaller breakout rooms, rooms this time, gremlins. I just call them grooms, like gremlin rooms, <laughs> so that you have more time to share with one another. Have fun talking about your gremlin. Welcome back. Anybody wanna share the story of their gremlin? What, is, what does their gremlin look like or sound like? Well, we decided that um, uh, we decided social media can be a gremlin. Oh, interesting! It can take yeah. the form of a gremlin. Yeah, yeah. that's we true. Also, yeah, we all we all even at all of our we had many different ages, 
but we decided mm. that uh, we've all questioned ourselves as as good moms mm. are we doing the best we can i mean who hasn't felt that right especially with your first child and um you look at social media and all these people are doing all this so great it's like what so that can be a gremlin and we've of mm. course we of course had faced gremlins in our jobs in terms mm -hmm. of being promoted and can I do this? And it's not an am I worthy thing. It's it's okay, that's great promotion. Okay, now I really have to step up. Can I do this? And questioning yourself. It's it's pretty, I think that's pretty common. Yeah. And you just that's kind true. of dive in and do it. Thank you so much for telling us where gremlins show up. How about anybody else? What is or in the chat, what does your gremlin look like or sound like? Something I didn't share in our group, I don't think I really thought about it till now, was that sometimes my gremlin sounds like um, I have to prove to everybody else that I should be where I'm at. Um, and that just, it just negatively impacts not only like who I am at work, but my friendships and my marriage and all these things, it just kind of explodes everywhere. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody, one last thought about gremlins before we move on to, it's funny, we were talking about social media. We're gonna hear from Sheryl Sandberg from one of the CEO of Facebook. <laughs> but anybody else, what is your gremlin like? We talked a little bit about how, um, we didn't actually say that it's a gremlin, but um, we talked a bit about how it's this pressure that you're supposed to be perfect or you're supposed to be so good at whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, it, and then the, the fear comes that what if it isn't perfect, then everyone's going to realize that you're, you know, it's, you're just, you're not all that or, um, and that, that, that's sort of a crippling notion. It just brings that anxiety. Uh, but it's yeah, it's that that striving for being competent and perfect in in what you do. Great, thank you so much. And lots of research too about how important it is for girls early on to learn how to make mistakes, um, mm. and to cultivate that. That's a different that's a different wow session. I wanted to share with you a couple of thoughts about the gremlin as Katie is getting ready for our Cheryl Sandberg clip. So Rick Carson suggests, oh, oh, keep going. I've got my notes. Rick Carson suggests that the key is choice with your gremlin, right? Don't grapple with your gremlin. Simply notice him or her fully and then choose to redirect your awareness or not. The other mm, gem, there are several gems uh, related to gremlins from this book. Worry is a cerebral house of mirrors in, into which your gremlin ushers you. Worry and constructive thought are different processes. Worry is fraught with anguish, feels lousy, and results in shallow breathing. Notice just stating that may be Constructive thought involves knowing where you wanna be and taking the steps to get there. So again, that opening line is so great. Worry is a cerebral house of mirrors into which your gremlin ushers you. And you can choose not to go. All right, let's cue up the Sheryl Sandberg clip to help us think about combating imposterism. When I was in college, my senior year, I took a course called European Intellectual History. Don't you love that kind of thing from college? <laughs> Wish I could do that now. And I took it with my roommate, Carrie who was then a brilliant literary student and went on to be a brilliant literary scholar. And my brother, smart guy, but a water polo playing pre-med who was a sophomore. The three of us take this class together. And then Carrie reads all the books in the original Greek and Latin, goes to all the lectures. I read all the books in English and go to most of the lectures. My brother is kind of busy. He reads one book of 12 and goes to a couple of lectures, marches himself up, to our room a couple days before the exam to get himself tutored. The three of us go to the exam together and we sit down and we study, you know, sit there for three hours in our little blue notebooks. Yes, I'm that old. And we walk out and we look at each other and we say, how'd you do? 
And Carrie says, boy, I feel like I didn't really draw out the main point on the Hegelian dialectic. And I say, God, I really wish I had really connected John Locke's theory of property, the philosophers that follow. And my brother says, I got the top grade in the class. <laughs> you got the top grade in the class? You don't know anything. <laughs> the problem with these stories is that they show what the data shows. Women systematically underestimate their own abilities. If you test men and women and you ask them questions on totally objective criteria like GPAs, men get it wrong slightly high and women get it wrong slightly low. Women do not negotiate for themselves in the workforce. A study in the last two years of people entering the workforce out of college showed that 57% of boys entering, or men, I guess, are negotiating their first salary and only 7% of women. And most importantly, men attribute their success to themselves and women attribute it to other external factors. If you ask men why they did a good job, they'll say, I'm awesome. If you ask, <laughs> obviously, why are you even asking? If you ask women why they did a good job, what they'll say is someone helped them, they got lucky, they worked really hard. Why does this matter? Boy, it matters a lot. Because no one gets to the corner office by sitting on the side, not at the table. And no one gets the promotion if they don't think they deserve their success or they don't even understand their own success. I wish the answer were easy. I wish I could just go tell all the young women I work for, all these fabulous women, believe in yourself, negotiate for yourself, own your own success. Thank you so much. So uh, you like the Sheryl Sandberg. That's the text I've taught a lot. There's, it is not uncontroversial, but um, I highly encourage you to read it. It was very moving to 18 to 22 year olds when I taught it for years. Many people called it, it came out about 10 years ago, one of the most important women's leadership books of the last 50 years. Um, there are, there's a lot of wisdom and she's also speaking from her own particular place, um, frequently a privilege of, you know, working at Facebook and having a lot of help and support to do that. Still, that does not take away from many of the gems, the gold mines in that um, book. The TED Talk is also great, and it's 20 minutes if you like that clip. So we're going to go into breakout rooms. And you're going to talk about, have you seen someone underestimate herself, right, or not sit at the table? And it could be you. You don't have to confess it or you can, or maybe you've seen that in someone else. What advice would you give to that person? Right, what advice would you give to that woman? Okay, go have fun. Welcome back. We just have a few minutes left. Uh, what a rich and short night it has been already. We wanna honor the time because we wanna respect your boundaries and you wanna go have hot cocoa and uh, apple pie. So in the chat uh, or raise your hand, what's a takeaway from tonight? How are you going to address imposterism differently. And please start with the chat. It's most, the most important thing you learned that you might share. You might share with somebody else. You left this and they said, what did you learn? Talk about it. Great. So I'm going to share um, a New York Times article and this will be something she, Katie shares tomorrow that talking about it, it seems so simple, but it's so important because you realize you're not alone. Mm, I'm gonna stay more aware and stay positive when the gremlin strikes, great. Squash the gremlin. Mm, help prop someone else up, be aware of their imposter syndrome and that actually helps you manage yours. Mm, I really like the bit about the gremlin, the quote about worries, it's really powerful. Yeah, that's, a, house of mirrors that you don't, you have control over whether you want to enter into or not. Feel that you've earned your positions. Others have noticed it, right? So remember from the opening video, there are ways that you can objectively know your value and worth and to remember those and to call those up. This is this power of positive psychology, evidence-based research related to that. We're always better than we think. Great. From the New York Times piece too, uh, remember positive self-talk, awareness, and just recognizing that it exists. <clears throat> One of the things that Katie and I realized in putting this together 
is that we did not get to authentic leadership because we really wanted to just address imposter syndrome and remind you that now you have a label, you have language, you did it before, but you have language even more now for what this is, and you have tools in order to manage it. So stay tuned if you want to learn more about authentic leadership. That's something that we can do in a future WOW talk. I will tell you that one of the secrets to authentic leadership is to remember, like the Star Wars Trash Compactor, people are always trying to define your leadership for you, but that you get to define it for yourself. Katie, you want to close for us? It was such a privilege being with you. I do. And I know everyone loves these sessions. I love the fact that I've seen so many familiar faces throughout the WOW program. And that really just warms my heart because I know it speaks to so many of you and it speaks to Carlin and I as well. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, as customary, we'll send out a follow-up survey with an opportunity to share your feedback and also how you could potentially become more involved with WOW or other topics that are of interest to you. Um, we'll be sharing some of the Cheryl Sandberg, uh, the book, the video, the TED Talk. I'll share the, the whole piece. It's really enlightening to watch. Um, also the handout and um, about from Rick Carlson with some of those tips. And then finally, I just wanted to promote um, February 2nd will be our next WOW speaker series. And it's a little different. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of Title IX uh, for women in athletics. And it's also National uh, Women and Girls in Sports Day on the 2nd. And we thought, what a fitting time to really embrace the power of females in um, athletics, as leaders within sports teams, but really how it goes beyond the field. And so much of what people learn on a field as part of a team or a community are things and traits that you can take with you in your careers or your professions or in your life. So we're really looking forward to bringing that session with, to all of you on February 2nd, um, as well as more information to come. And also just a teaser, we will be having a full WOW weekend um, in 2022 in the fall, probably sometime in November. Um, it will be probably a hybrid model as well, where some of you can come to campus, but also join us where you are from your, your homes, which is wonderful. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Carlin. Look for more information on future sessions and um, look forward to seeing you all virtually or in person very soon. Have a great night. Have a great night.